Good morning, everybody. Good to be back here with you on From the Deep End. Thank you for tuning in, being a part of the program this morning. Appreciate uh, y'all getting up early with me this morning and dealing with uh, some, hopefully some really good Bible topics as we uh, open them together and uh, study from the Word of God for a moment. Um, I feel like I'm awfully short now that I look at that. Look at that. Just a second there. That's better. There we go. Um, I see. I, I, har I try not to move my camera ever because then every time you move your camera, it just messes up everything. And I moved my camera over the weekend and it messed up my, my setup. So anyway, good to be back here with you on from the deep end. Uh, sorry about yesterday. Um, well, I'm not really sorry about it. I'm not. I, I, <laughs> it's a long weekend uh, here at the Rockless Church. We had a lot to get done. And boy, that, that extra sleep Monday morning felt really, really good. So. Uh, but it's good to be back here with you today as we um, uh, pick up another week of uh, Bible study here on From the Deep End. Of course, you know what we do here by now. We uh, first hour of the program, um, we um, study the Word of God together through your Bible questions. So whatever's on your mind today, feel free to go ahead and put that in. I'll try my best to uh, to give you a Bible answer. Um, if, I, if I know one, sometimes I don't know is... Uh, is is the answer that I'll give you, as you you all know. I think uh, one morning last week, I think y'all got me about three or four times. It feels like, right? I just had to say, I don't know. Uh, but if sometimes that is the best and the proper answer to give um, uh, to it. Yes, I see y'all talking about the Alabama Tennessee game in the comment section because Alabama football is always on the table as well. And uh, let me just say congratulations to Tennessee. And I'm gonna stop right about there. Um, I'm going to stop right about there. Anything else I say past that is probably not productive, but congratulations, Tennessee. What, you know, one out of every 16, I guess that's okay. Um, I will say, I hope we get to see you again in Georgia. I, I hope we get to see you in Atlanta. Go go ahead and beat Georgia and come on. Come on to Atlanta. Let's, let's run that one back one more time. Let's do that. Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing that. I, th I think the outcome might not be the same. Uh, but anyway, uh, good to be back here for this program. Uh, the second hour of the program, we're going to be starting our study of uh, Second Peter. Uh, just seemed like the logical thing to do. Um, I had a few requests about uh, uh, doing something on prayer, which I mentioned that I had been trying to put some material together for that. And uh, that may be where we go after we finish up uh, Second Peter. It's just uh, we haven't really done an in-depth topical type study uh, together yet on the uh, in the second hour everything we've done so far has been textual so uh, uh, I think I might uh, might, might slip that uh, discussion of prayer on into the mix as we uh, as we go forward from there that that's where I'm leaning at the moment and is always subject to uh, to change uh, no matter based on how I feel and what's on my mind so uh, anyway let's we'll see what we have here in the comment section beyond you know smart alecky people trying to talk to me about the, about Alabama Tennessee um, Jonathan, what do you got there? What is your take on pre dispensational premillennialism? I don't like it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you want more than that, though, right? You probably gonna want more than I don't like it. Um, which part of it? Uh, um, uh, to me, it is it is a fundamentally fundamentally flawed. Um, 
uh, take on on a lot of Bible passages. Um, I, I don't know. I it just I'm not even sure where to start as I as I start uh, you know processing that in my brain. Um, I, I guess. If I were Eric, let me say it this way, because I know Eric answers questions like this. I get down to the weeds and start answering technical questions and that kind of stuff. You ask Eric a question like this, um, and he's going to he's going to give you a big picture overview of it. Uh, don't don't ever ask Eric. You know, sometimes we talk a lot about the eighty seventy doctrine and preterism and all of that. Um, you can't have a good discussion with Eric about uh, preterism and those kind of things because he. Um, he, he, he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't ever get down in the weeds about it and because he has a conceptual problem with it and and he talks about it from a big picture standpoint and I think that's where I start when I deal with premillennial dispensational premillennialism uh, frankly well maybe not every form of premillennialism because I don't know that I have them all on the top of my head what they are um, <clears throat> but let's just since you ask about dispensational premillennialism let's start there. The foundational problem that I see with dispensational premillennialism is it is, although they deny this, it is a shot at the sovereignty of God. It is an assault directly at the sovereignty of God. Um, the base idea in, pre in dispensational premillennialism as it relates to our time right now is that effectively we are in, well, in, in, in old school dispensational premillennialism, basically there are seven dispensations. Um, and we, I guess, are technically living as, I guess it's the sixth, if I remember correctly, because the, the last one is going to be the, 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 the thousand years and we are the time leading up to the thousand years. I believe that's, I believe that's about right. Um, but the thought, of course, is then that Jesus came and offered himself to the Jews, and the Jews rejected him. So at that moment, effectively, God pivoted and held the kingdom in abeyance uh, and did not bring the offering of the kingdom to the Jews because they rejected him, rejected the Christ. Um, and in its place, they put, or he put, the church um, and so sometimes you'll you'll even you'll read um, uh, premillennial uh, teaching. I, I was just reading a, a commentary last week. Sometime I forget what I was studying, but I was reading a commentary last week on on the topic and um, teaching Daniel. So I may have been reading out of Daniel seven. Um, I may be able to actually if I can keep talking, let's see if I can do two things at once. I can't. I know I can't do two things at once, but I'm going to try and do two things at once here. Um, but the the um, the thought of of dispensational premillennialist is that um, the um, church is never included in Old Testament prophecy. Okay, the church is only included in. Um, the New Testament. All of the Old Testament prophecies are about the kingdom. Um, there's another book I'm, I was trying to think of that I that I used, studied from at one point in my in my educational career, um, and it was again a premillennial author, and said that um, the Old Testament prophets prophesied from the mountaintop, and from the mountaintop they saw the kingdom. Okay. But in, in all Old Testament prophecies, there are the valleys. The valleys were unseen. And in the unseen valleys, that's where the church is. So it was, it's, 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 it's not never mentioned in the Old Testament, but it's hidden uh, in, in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in the prophecies, okay? Um, okay it's, it's just a bunch of junk. I'm sorry. That's just I don't know how else to say it. That's just a bunch of junk. That that's not that is that is a direct assault at the sovereignty of God. About a direct assault at its at his foreknowledge. Does he know? Did he not know that they were going to reject him? And the problem with that is, of course, then you have prophecies like Isaiah 53, Isaiah 35, and other passages that that deal with the Messiah that clearly suggest that he's going to be rejected. 
Um, so he, he did foresee it. And did he not know that part of the Jewish rejection of the Messiah would be the cross? Because it's hard for him to get to the cross if the Jews accept him. There, there's no path to the cross if, if, if the Jewish leadership accepts him. The only way he gets there is if, if he comes unto his own and his own does not receive him. Um, and so that, that, that is a you know, conceptual problem that I've got. You're, you're starting to deal with um, statements that, that impugn the eternal purpose, the eternal plan of God. All right, so that that I guess that's from a high level. That's where I'd go. Um, the um, uh, the second area, you know, maybe the next level down is what I just referenced. Uh, Ephesians chapter three talks about uh, the eternal purpose that the mystery would be made known in the church. Ephesians three ten. Well, this mystery. Back in chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians, he worked all things according to the counsel of his will, and he made known unto us the mystery of his will, that he would, in the fullness of time, unite all things together in Christ, in heaven and in earth, and the fulfillment of that is Ephesians 3, 6, a Jew and Gentile united in the same body, partakers of the promise, so that that's, that's covenant, promise, that's going to take you all the way back, uh, to... Um, uh, um, uh, protection of the promise in Christ through, by the gospel, which is in the church, which to him, or well, the, that the manifold wisdom of God might be known in the heavenly places in the church. Last verse of Ephesians 3, I think it's the last verse, either the last verse or second to last verse of Ephesians 3. Then Paul, or yeah, Paul goes on and says, you know, to him be glory in the church throughout all ages. Um, the idea that somehow the church is a, is a, is an afterthought that it's, it's it's kind of like the appositive phrase in the in the uh, um, in the plan of God. You know what the appositive phrase is? That's where you have the commas offsetting the phrase in the middle of the sentence. If you take the appositive phrase out, it doesn't change the meaning of the sentence at all. Okay, that's just not that 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 that's that's not what the church is. The church is the is the fulfillment of the eternal purpose of God. And that's what Ephesians three says. Uh, it, it is not in any way uh, something that was added on later. It's not. Um, now, beyond that, and then, then you're going to have to get into all of the um, specific passages that they use to describe the different aspects of, um, of, of, of their interpretation of premillennial prophecy. From a, from a structural standpoint, this goes right along with it. One thing that premillennialists do, at least they say that they do, is that they take all prophecy literally. Okay, they do not believe that Revelation is a figurative book. They believe it is to be taken literally. Um, now, when you press them on it, obviously they start to run into problems with that. Uh, one of the favorite ones I had from my dad, and I, I can't remember all the specifics on it. Maybe I could talk and ask him about it Thursday. But I, I was reading through some notes, some old notes that he had on the book of Revelation. He taught a class for the, um, the school for the deaf, uh, it was basically a school of preaching for the deaf that uh, used to be going on at Roebuck Parkway in, um, in Birmingham. I think he taught the class there. And these were some notes that are actually compiled by uh, uh, Tim Shoemaker, if I'm not mistaken, Schumacher. Um, and I got a copy of them somehow. I think I still have them somewhere. But in the notes back there, handwritten in the notes, was something I guess my dad had written. I'm not sure where at all how, how the notes came down to me. But... Um, it's about the Battle of Armageddon and the number of horses that are said to be at the Battle of Armageddon. And I, I don't remember the number off the top of my head. I think it may be 100 million. And so I guess this was probably back in the late 80s, early 90s, when I, when I probably early 90s when I got a hold of these notes. So this is before Google. This is probably just from like the Encyclopedia Britannica or something. And, and whoever wrote this had gone to the... Um, I guess gone to the encyclopedia or something and had looked at the number of horses that existed in the world. Uh, and it came up, you know, it wasn't even half I th of the total number of horses that were needed to be at the battle of Armageddon. Okay. Th th you can't take it literally. 
you know, and, and, and then you're going to ride a horse into battle. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure you don't want a Shetland pony, which would be considered to be a horse. You want a war horse and the number of war horses there are available, you know, horses suitable to ride into battle. No, no, there's, there's no possible way that's literal. There's no possible, no possible way at all that that's, that that's possible. But that, that's one of their, their, their takes is that uh, all prophecy has to be taken literally. Well, they don't even hold to it. Um, but that's one of the tenets is because they think if you, if you, what, what they're trying to stop you from doing is allegorizing uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of prophecy, which different approaches to revelation effectively require you to do. If you have a, um, a cyclical view, a historical view of, of the book of revelation, there is that view that there is a cycle of history uh, and it keeps repeating and repeating and revelation is telling you the cycle of history. There you have to, to, to make that kind of interpretation right, you do have to kind of allegorize a lot of things because this stands for this, you know, in the, in the, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 oh, I was about trying to pick, pick something here. The, um, uh, the beast of the sea re it refers to this nation in, in the eighth century and in the 12th century, it refers to this nation. And when you see that cycle again and whatever cycle you've got in the 18th, 20th century, 21st century, it refers to that. You see, it, it then becomes a an, an allegorical symbol that you apply into your current age whenever you need it, and and that that's 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 an inappropriate view either uh, as well. So um, anyway, that's um um so <laughs> Travis says since you're feeling short this morning, maybe you needed a Shetland pony. Uh, uh, that, that's that's pretty good, sir. That's pretty good. Uh, so anyway, that's um. Um, that, that, that's, that's a kind of a top level view on it. Uh, Jonathan, I, I don't know, you know, if you want more specifics, any particular passages you have in mind, uh, it, it's, it's just a whole, let me, let me, let, let me say this. Uh, you'll hear me off. You'll, you'll hear me say often on the program, the Bible's not trying to trick you. It's trying to explain itself to you. Okay. When you start having to come up with Prophecy looks at the mountaintops and not the valleys. Um, and I heard another analogy. What is it? It's like um, something about the, the amount of light that is shed, that they have smaller lights and then bigger lights, that kind of stuff. I, I forget the exact, exact analogy. When you start having to come up with all of that to piece this together, or when you have to essentially have some kind of, um, you know, as I'll say sometimes, a secret decoder ring to understand the Bible. Um. You got a problem there. I got a great idea. Um, how about you keep it really simple? And in the Old Testament where um, the um, prophet Isaiah says, it'll come to pass that the, that the mountain of the Lord's house uh, shall be established above the hills and so on, that the word, of Lord, the word of the Lord shall go forth from Zion. How about when you have the word of the Lord going forth from Zion in Acts chapter two. How about you just connect those two passages instead of trying to interject some kind of um, um, more complex system on top of that? Why don't you just let those things refer to the same thing? And the moment you do that, the moment you say Isaiah to, you know, that old sermon sometimes, you know, Jonathan, I know you've got the outline. You went to Memphis, you got the outline. Uh, the great chapter twos of the Bible, Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, Joel 2, two all find their fulfillment in Acts 2. Um, the moment you let Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, and Joel 2 all refer to Acts 2, there's no dispensational premillennialism. You cannot allow Acts 2 to connect to any Old Testament prophecy. Strangely, in the middle of his sermon, Peter quotes about five or six Old Testament prophecies. Uh, one of which is, of course, Joel 2. So this is that which was spoken of by Joel. Um, and it should come to pass afterward, his quotation of it in the New Testament, it should come to pass in the last days. This is that which is spoken of by Joel. That That's a problem for premillennialists. Just is. Because you can't, you can't say that somehow that's a yet future thing. But if it's not a yet future thing, if it was intended for Acts 2, and it's clearly about the church, Peter makes the application, the church starts there in Acts 2. 
So Joel 2 prophesied of the, the events surrounding the establishment of the church. Kind of hard to prophesy about the events of the day without prophesying about the day. Uh, so it's just what you simplify the Bible. Don't don't make it harder than it is. It's not talking about the number of things the Bible is actually considering. The number of things it's actually talking about is a much smaller number than people think. Uh, and that's you'll hear me often in, 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 on this program talk about the idea that um, um, uh, talk about the idea that um, I just lost my train of thought. What was that? What was I about to say? Um. Oh, uh, you'll hear me often talk about the idea of, of making sure you leave a text in the first century, that kind of thing. And and you go through and you try to, because we're trying to bring the application forward to us, we, we take specific statements of the Bible and we generalize them. So we just got done with First Peter, the fiery trial that's come upon you. We try to bring that forward and say that every one of us who serves as a Christian is going to serve a fiery trial. Well, if that's true, if that's what First Peter means, that there's a fiery trial that comes upon the life of every generation, every Christian. Okay, then if that's true, then you're going to have to generalize all of the surrounding statements about that. And at the very least, you're going to have God redoing things that he's already done. So you get down to chapter 5 and verse 10, and he says, After you have suffered a little while, God himself, the God of all peace, will himself restore uh, confirm, uh, strengthen, establish you, or whatever the order there is of those four things. But he'll restore you and establish you, okay? Does he have to do that in every generation? Does he have to do that for every people? Fiery trial come, let you suffer a little while, and then establish you? Well, why why, why, why is he having to redo his work in every generation and in every life? See, that, that just makes no sense. And, and you lose the significance when you do that, all right? And you're doing the same thing here with, with premillennial theology. You're trying to make the Bible refer to a whole bunch of things when it just refers to one thing, just one thing. And that, that is Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, Joel 2, fulfilled in Acts 2, and, and, and so on. That makes it a lot simpler. Um, and usually the, the, the simple answer is going to be the right one, usually. So um, Jonathan, follow up, a couple, couple of follow-ups there. Got a long quote there from MacArthur. Um, let's see what, you said, what the quote is there. I didn't read all this yet. He will return to an increasingly wicked earth. Uh, he will come in fiery judgment. He will judge all the ungodly of the earth and then establish the rule of his kingdom forever. The first phase of the eternal rule will be his reign on earth, um, which will last, as Revelation 20 says, six, six times, a thousand years, after which his rule will continue because it is an everlasting lasting rule. But it will continue in a new heaven, a new earth that will, replaces uh, this heaven uh, and earth which will melt in an atomic implosion and, and make way for the new creation. So that's that's MacArthur's take on it. So MacArthur is not only dispensational premillennialist from that quote, and I didn't know this about MacArthur. I haven't frankly read a lot of his end time stuff, but it sounds like MacArthur is also then a, uh, a restored heaven, restored earth person because he's got the first earth, earth being destroyed and then being replaced with a new earth. Um, so maybe... Maybe he's also maybe he's also that. Not every dispensational premillennialist is. Those are those are not necessarily the same doctrines. Um, but um, yeah, if he is if he is he is that. Um, uh, another statement there. Yeah, uh, Jonathan, just continuing this discussion. There, there, there. That's one reason you got to be really careful when you buy a study Bible. Um, there, there's. If, if it's a denominational study Bible, it, it is full. Uh, you know, obviously, it's almost always faith only. Um, it's almost always faith only. Um, it is almost always, at least to some degree or another, uh, Calvinistically influenced. I'll say it that way. Uh, some 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 degree of depravity slash original sin is, is be mixed into the notes almost all almost always. Um, and then some form of, if it's not dispensational premillennial, premillennialism, uh, it, it is um, some form of premillennialism. Um, but, you know, to go back to, the, to the MacArthur quote back here, I didn't actually address this at all, Jonathan, but of specific statements that are, um, that are wrong um, from Scripture. That are, are st st certain statements from Scripture that prove that premillennialism is wrong. Um, this idea that he's going to come back and rule upon the earth 
you, you know, you can go to Zechariah 6, Zechariah 12, um, well, 12, 13, 14, really old thing, a section there, but really 12, um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, there's no statement that Jesus would ever return to the earth. And if he did try to return to the earth, the uh, Hebrews talks about that if he were on earth, he could not be a priest and so on. So um, so there are a lot of passages which you could use to uh, to try and unwind it. But I, th th again, you're getting down in the weeds. Uh, here, here again is a, a time when you're dealing with dispensational premillennialism. Don't chase them around from verse to verse to passage to passage. Because frankly, in, in some obscure reference in Ezekiel, I mean, they, they've read seven books with, with, their, with their scholars uh, trying to give a, 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 an analysis of, of you know, what that verse in that obscure passage in Ezekiel refers to in premillennial theology. And they've thought about it a whole lot more than you have, right? Um, it, it'd be like somebody walking off the street and, and challenging you on his baptism for the remission of sins. Okay, the fact that, well, it, it is true, but it doesn't really matter if it's true or not. Okay, because you've studied it so much better than they have. You, you, could, you, you, could, you could craft an argument that they don't know how to answer simply because they don't know it as well. Uh, it doesn't mean your position is true. It is in that instance, but it doesn't mean your position is true. It just means that you're more skillful at it and you can win the debate. Okay, um, and so that's the um, that's the thought. Yeah, I just saw that quote in there from. I'll get to it in a second, Jonathan. Uh, but yeah, about Jesus sitting on the throne again. Uh, Jeremiah twenty two thirty is a great passage to rem remember. We'll get there in just a moment. Uh, but you know, th there there's the idea is if you if you start chasing them around the Bible, you have accepted their premise, or at least accepted that their premise has the possibility that it might be true. That's why the conceptual answer is sometimes a better one. So you're telling me God prophesied that Jesus would come and die on the cross, but it was also unseen that the church would come out from Acts 2. I mean, it's just that's a conceptual question that at some point, there's no way, there is no way, if you're going to tell me on one hand the church is never envisioned in Old Testament prophecy, and then the church is the answer to the cross— there, there's a sovereignty, uh, omniscience, maybe omnipotence problem in that construction. I know the rest of your doctrine's wrong because you just impugned God. If your doctrine is right, God is no longer God. So that's that's the level of conversation I want to have. I want to start at the premise level, not not down there in the weeds with it. I want to start on the premise level if I can, because to me that. That that's the place you attack it. It's just like you do with, uh, at least in my opinion, you do, do deal with the re the realized eschatologist crowd. They spiritualize death. They have to have spiritual death as the primary death of the Bible. Okay, let's start there, because if if, if it's physical death, it answers to a physical resurrection, or a physical resur physical resurrection answers to it. And now we've got a whole, you know, if if that's true, then everything else you say, regardless if you get time statements right. Your doctrine is not really about time. Your doctrine is about the nature of death and the resurrection. That's what realized eschatology is actually about. But I want to deal with the premise level. And the premise is that the resurrection is spiritual. Without the spiritual resurrection, I don't care what you I don't care how skillful you are at piecing together and stringing together the time statements. Great. I can do that too. And I can do that almost as well as you can. And yet I don't come to your conclusion. It's because I don't believe in the spiritual resurrection, or at least not as a as the primary thing. Obviously, there is John 5, but the, the first of the resurrections in John 5. But I, because I disagree with your premise, and I think I can disprove your premise, the rest of your doctrine falls apart. I think the same thing's true with um, dispensational premillennialism as well. Anyway, uh, I do want to mention that passage, that one more thing, Jonathan, you got there on that, that other statement. Um when they take this literally, thus saith the Lord, write this, write this man down childless, a man who will not prosper in his days, for no more of his descendants will prosper sitting on his throne uh, of, of uh, David or ruling again in Judah. The man he's referring to there is one of the last kings of Judah, uh, uh, Jeconiah, if I remember correct, called Jeconiah or Coniah. Um, that, where was he? Was he the... 
second to last. I, I, the last five kings, I've, 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 I've been a long time since I've run through those. Zedekiah was last. Um, you know, Jeconiah. I'll we'll say Jeconiah might have been second to last. He, he may have been the middle. He may have been the third last, but anywhere. doesn't really matter. One of the last five kings of Judah. Um, and Jeremiah makes his prophecy about him. And the problem, of course, with that is that if you read through the genealogy, um, Jesus is in the genealogy, is a descendant of this man. And Jeremiah 22, 30 says very explicitly that there will not be any descendant of his sitting on the throne, on the throne, of, sitting on the throne of David, ruling in, Jeru in Judah. Okay. Um, he can't do it. So that, that, that is a, a, that's another one of those passages, which, uh, do, does a, um, um, he is, um, I'm sorry. I got to quit reading the comments when I'm trying to talk, <laughs> it, especially I need to just like put a, a filter on Travis that, that maybe Travis needs to start each comment with, uh, with, with some kind of character string of characters so that I know it's an actual serious comment because most of the time he's just being snarky. Yeah, I see you in there. Um, but uh, yeah, so Jer Jeremiah twenty two thirty is one of those passages. If you're dealing with premillennialism, uh, you need to remember it. And I had for I had forgotten to bring it up. So appreciate you uh, uh, catching my brain on that one. So um, uh, yeah, uh, so let's go back up here and saw at least one other question. Um. Connie says, last night the speaker said sins weren't forgiven under the old law, but many times in Leviticus it says sins are forgiven. Can you explain? Uh, I have never had that conversation with Scott. Um, um, and I would, you know, obviously obviously you've heard what I've got to say on the matter. Uh, I, that, in my view is, yeah, that they were forgiven. I mean, that, you're, you're right. You know, we go back, we've done this in the past. We spent some time in uh, Leviticus 4, Leviticus 5, all that section. And there's, you know, second, I, I forget, let's call it a dozen. Let's call it a dozen times that the Bible just very explicitly says, yeah, and your sins will be forgiven. Your sins shall be forgiven uh, over and over again. And, and I always make the point when I study that is, okay, it's, it's real easy for us to, uh, to grab our Bibles, right? And, and we read through, uh, you know, Leviticus chapter Leviticus, hey, I actually did open to Leviticus 4. Um, it's real easy to grab our Bibles and, and, and read through Leviticus chapter 4 right here and see your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven. And then we turn around and we go back. I'm not going to be as lucky to get Hebrews chapter 10, oh, am I? I got Hebrews 7. That's close enough. Uh, it's real easy to go back over here to uh, to Hebrews chapter 7 and and read that uh, you know, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Okay. And so what we do then is we read this passage over here in Hebrews, and then we interpret Leviticus 4 by it, forgetting, kind of overlooking that in between there, that there, there's a whole lot of Bible in between those two points, right? And that whole lot of Bible has a lot of revelation in it, and also a great passage of time takes place between this point and this point, right? Right? Now, the critical thing to get is that the people who were there when this was written, okay, the, the people who actually heard the giving of the law, those people did not have access to everything that we have over here. So the totality of the revelation that they have is when you do this, you bring this offering to the priest, it shall be forgiven you. That that's the totality of the of the the revelation that they have. They have this much, okay. See, see, they have that much. That's all they've got. And when they read, their sins were forgiven. I'm going to think that maybe they walked away from that, saying, "Hey, you know what? My sins were forgiven. I made that offering." Now, that statement's either true or not. And, and nothing that's going to come after that is going to change that truth. Okay? Nothing that comes after that can change it. Because if it changes it, that turns the first part into a, into a falsehood. 
And the last time I checked, somewhere in my Bible, it says God cannot, God who cannot lie. That, that's a problem for me. Either God lied at the beginning or God lied at the end. If it's the case that he told one group of people, you bring this offering and your sins will be forgiven. And another group of people that says, if you bring this offering, your sins won't be forgiven. So now there are two different ways that people can talk about that. And this is why I have, I've never had this conversation with, with Scott. And I, I, I don't know where, where he would be on the matter. Um, but, you know, there are some people who, the, 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 there are some people who say that they were forgiven. How's the language I've heard, heard it said? Uh, they were forgiven in prospect. Okay. And what they mean by that is they are forgiven. They are declared forgiven, but they are not actually forgiven until the cross. So they were forget they were forgiven in prospect. In view of the coming cross, they were forgiven. Okay. But in reality, the point they would make is, no, they weren't actually forgiven then. They were just declared forgiven. Well, to me, that's a distinction without a difference. Either if they're forgiven, they're forgiven. If you declare them forgiven, regardless of the basis of your declaring them forgiven, they're forgiven. So if that's the view that somebody takes, I'm actually in pretty much the same position they are. Because my position would be, yeah, they are forgiven, and that's a problem. They, they are forgiven, and that is an absolute problem problem. The problem is that God was not just, God was not righteous in declaring those sins forgiven. And we need to clear that up. That's that's, that's the end of Romans chapter 3. So that, that's one view of it. Um, I, I'm not going to, you know, cause any stink with anybody, but that concept that the um, that sins are simply rolled forward year by year, um, I don't like that one at all. Uh, that, that that to me sounds like a middle position that has the weak points of both of the of the private the previous um, uh, previous positions. Um, so um, uh, that 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 one just makes no sense. I know where we get it. We get the language. We get the language of sins being rolled forward from Hebrews chapter ten. There is there is year by year a remembrance made, or there's a remembrance made year by year of those sins. Uh, and so that, that, that to me is, is one, I don't, I, I, I that, that it, it seems like to me, that's a convenience. Um, and I, I don't, I don't like that one. And like I said, I don't know, I don't know where Scott is on it. Um, and, uh, kind of, you may find this hard to believe, but, um, um, after 550 nights and, and sitting in front of this camera, sometimes four five, six hours a day. Um, you may find this hard to believe that occasionally I get up and walk around when people are preaching. Uh, and actually, I, actually we had, um, some people here doing our, our Monday night for the master thing last night. And I was at the building, obviously I was right here and they were down the hall writing the cards and stuff for Monday night for the master. So it's in the middle of Scott's lesson. I got up and walked down to say hi to all the people doing Monday night for the master. Um, and that statement that Scott made, I don't remember hearing it. <laughs> so, um, so I, I, even from the context of what he said last night, I can't, I can't, uh, uh, I can't comment on it with any, with any certainty. Cause if I heard it, I don't remember. I try to keep my earbud in. So if I do get up and walk around, I still get to hear what's being said, but the room for the, um, uh, Monday night for the master, um, is farther than my Bluetooth connection will let me go. So I had to, I had to put my earbud down. So there was about a 10 or 15 minute period in there that I didn't hear it. So uh, now you're making me make confessions online. <laughs> uh, Travis said I slept when you were preaching. No, unfortunately I didn't, Travis. That's only happened twice, right? <laughs> happened once early on. It was a Saturday night, Denny Patrillo. The night it was the, it was the nine o'clock session. And I, 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 I didn't, I didn't make it through Denny's lesson. Um, it happened one night. I think it was with Stephen Ford. Uh, it was Stephen. I, I think I left Stephen out to hang for a few minutes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's twice out of five hundred nights. I think that's actually pretty good. Myself at my age, we can you can fall asleep here. I can fall asleep talking right now. So, uh, but anyway, let, let's see what we got here. Um, 
Let me, I saw something there, not really a question, but I wanted to, um, where is that? Uh, was it Joyce? Where did I just saw it. Come on. Come on. Um, this statement from Joyce. There it is. Joyce said I couldn't find you last night. Hey, Joyce. Um, yeah, we were having some Facebook connection issues. Uh, I, hopefully we got it solved because we came on Facebook today. Um, it, it, we came on Facebook today. Um, and I don't know. I don't know what was going on. Uh, I, I did the thing that you're supposed to do anytime a tech problem comes up is I basically I turned everything off and turned it back on again. Uh, because that, that solves every tech problem. Um, there's a, there's a show, it was a British show. Um, it was the, the IT crowd, I believe it is. It's, it's it's in an office building. It's set in an office building, and down in the basement's the IT IT people, and that was a running gag for the entire series. That the first thing they would add, they would answer the phone with is, "Have you turned it off and turned it back on again?" They actually had a an automated system to answer the phone. Have you turned it off and turned it back on again? That, that's what I did. I disconnected Facebook and reconnected it. I turned it off and turned it back on again, um, and it, it seems to be working now. We'll see if that actually fixed it or not, but. Uh, so hopefully that will be um, be fixed going forward, and you won't have that problem again, Joyce. Uh, see some conversation going on on there about um, the um, um, the different study Bibles. Obviously, the AP Study Bible um, is is you're going to have a lot better luck in terms of uh, of of um, um, not having a lot of um, denominational error. And you're not going to have any denominational error. The guys at AP are solid. Uh, so I, I haven't used it much, so I can't give a lot of personal testimony on it. I've uh, One of our members here has one, so I have thumbed through it and read, you know, read their comments on what I thought were some, you know, you got passages you go to when you, when you want to find out what a study Bible is like. I've got certain passages that I'll go to. Uh, passages on baptism, passages on the church, pa you know, those kind of things, just to see what they say. Um, and obviously AP get, does their stuff very well. Uh, I just don't, I don't use a lot of those kind of study Bibles, uh, partly because I'm, I'm so much, I'm digital now anyway. Uh, so I've got my, I have Logos on my tablet. I've got it on my phone. Uh, obviously I've got it on my laptops and my desktops. I've got it pretty much everywhere. And that sort of solves the problem, the needing, needing of a study Bible, because I've got I've got my whole library effectively right there on my tablet whenever I need it. Um, but even before that, I wasn't a huge fan of study Bibles because um, at least for me, I like a blank page. I, I like as much of a blank page as possible so that when I'm looking at it, I'm not getting my, my thoughts filtered through somebody else's thoughts. And sometimes those study Bibles, if you look at them, uh, I mean, they will have two thirds of the page taken up on commentary and just right at the top and, you know, still have the two column approach, but they'll have like eight lines of text of the, of, of the, of the Bible on that one page. And so um, among other things, it makes your Bibles huge. I mean, I saw I, 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 when I was at the up at Fisk Boulevard a couple of weeks ago on Tuesday night, there was this Bible sitting on the, on the, well, it's sit, sitting on a, a shelf somewhere. What a shelf, but uh, sitting out. It was just sitting out. That's the thickest Bible I've ever seen in my life, other than like some of those, you know, middle age Bibles with all the artwork and stuff in them. I mean, it, 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 it was easily four times this thick. I mean, that was the, that was like, I don't think I could grab my hand all the way around the binding of this thing. It was so big. And I kept looking at it like, did it get wet and swell up? Does that person have all kind of paper filed inside of it? By the way, don't ever let my dad see you do that with your Bible. Man, if you if you come in, do I have anything in my Bible? Oh, yep. I'm in trouble. See what I did? I had a I got a it was a card we handed out on Sunday for something that we're doing for for, for the Saints here at, 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 at Rockledge. But if you ever see if you ever if my dad ever sees you doing that. He will turn to you and say, don't use your Bible as a filing cabinet. Don't use your Bible as a filing cabinet. But this person didn't. I mean, there was nothing in that Bible. It was, it was just huge, huge. I don't even know what it was. I don't. It had to be a study Bible. Had to be a, had to be a large print study Bible. That's what it had to be. 
Uh, somebody else's buy one, I didn't go mess with it. But that, the thickest thing I've ever seen, man. And, and I don't want to carry that around with me. I mean, that's like, I mean, I guess if you get assaulted on the street, you can hit somebody with it. <laughs> I mean, like Travis talking about riding Shetland, Shetland pony into battle. There you go. <laughs> I've got me a brick that I can hit somebody with. Uh, so I'm not a huge fan of, uh, of study Bibles in general. Uh, you know, I, I like my Bible to be my Bible. And my study aids to be my study aids. I don't. I don't like to uh, to mix them. Uh, but that's just me. People love them. Um, I saw somebody in there saying that they. She just was it Sue. Um. Um. Was it Sue? Yep. Yeah, it was Sue. Said she just received her uh, 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 chain reference study Bible, and she says she's trying to learn how to use it. Give me a second here. No, I don't have that one here. Um. No, I don't. Uh, the only study Bible I have ever used <clears throat> at length is the Tom, the Thompson chain reference. Uh, now, Sue, uh, it has its own denominational bit. You're going to find some, um, some, some of the, some of the, 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 the references that it links to, uh, do have some, I don't know if it's all premillennial, it's, but, um, it's, th th there is some denominational bias, even in the Thompson chain reference. Uh, the thing I do like about the Thompson Chain Reference as a study Bible is it does not have a lot of commentary. So I can tell by the verses they're putting in their chain what they're trying to get me to see. But in the chain, largely, it's just a chain of references, hence the name of the of the of the Bible. And as such, it doesn't really, um, you know, a, a Thompson Chain Reference is not necessarily a whole lot thicker than just say something like this. Um, you know, in the time, see that these, these lights wash out in these screen, these things, I don't want to try and put them on the screen. But um, if you can see that at all, I mean, this is just a wide, this is just a wide margin Cambridge um, ESV, not a Cambridge. Um, it's Crossway. Crossway makes ESV. Um, but um, uh, the Thompson chain reference basically will just fill up that area with the uh, the numbers for the chain references. So there's still, depending on the page and how many rep chain references they have on the page, there is still sometimes um, space in the margins. But there's almost never, at least in the old, I haven't used one in a lot of years. And my, my copy of it is, well, it's what I started Memphis with. My, my, my Thompson is what I started Memphis with. So that'd be 92 when I was using it. I, I, I don't know if my dad bought it for me when I went to Memphis. I'm trying to remember when I got that one. I think I had it before I got to Memphis. But it's what I used for the first year or so that I was at Memphis. Um, and it just doesn't take up a lot of extra page. So I like it in that it it can help jog some some verses to my mind that I wouldn't necessarily think of. Um, and I do like how it will have in the in the in in a lot of instances, if you're hitting one of their change, let's say it's number 3264, and let's say I'm here in Matthew, well, open open to Matthew 24. So that's Matthew 24, 32 right there. And so if it's if if the next link in the chain, let's say it takes me over to Mark 13, it'll go ahead and give me Mark 13 right there. And then I can turn to Mark 13. And, and that's how the chain works. You can just go through and turn your Bible to each one of those links in the chain, or you can turn to the back and and you can get that is there. Uh, you know, can continue to see the whole list there in the back of it. So I, that it's my favorite in terms of uh, of a study Bible. Now it does not give you all of the detail, all of the commentary that a lot of these thicker, heavier study Bibles do. Um, so um, that you know, that's it's it's it, it's a matter of preference. As I as I'll tell people on these kind of things, um, um, is that oh, I'm sorry. Um, a lot of it is just understanding the tool that you have in your hand. Okay. You need to understand whatever Bible you use. That, that go, goes for translation, and maybe we can, as a topical study, review translations at some point. I've got, I've got some material we could do. That I could probably do it in a week, maybe week and a half, two weeks, uh, where we just, where I just go through um, all all the all the translations, talk about their strengths, their weaknesses, all that kind of stuff, um, and uh, that that would be useful. But even beyond translation, you need to know the kind of Bible that you have in your hand. Because sometimes a study Bible is 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 slanted toward different ideas. 
like Thompson's trying to chain references together for you. Okay. There are some that are like the, the AP, obviously that it's got a lot of apologetic stuff in it because it's, it's from AP. It's got a lot of other stuff too, but it's got, it's got an emphasis on some of that stuff and so on. So sometimes each study Bible has its own niche that it's trying to, trying to fill. So you need to know the tool that's in your hand. Uh, and that, that is, that is as, as important as, as anything is uh, on, um, on making sure you use um, you use them properly, and then can find because all these all these study Bibles, even the one by AP, um, I'm going to guess the one at AP. I haven't, I don't remember looking at it, but I'm going to guess the one at AP late dates the Book of Revelation would be my guess. I don't know if there are any early daters at, at uh, Apologetics Express or not. My guess is they late date the Revelation. I would disagree with that all the way through, and some of the commentary they give on Daniel seven, Daniel nine. Obviously, passages in Revelation, maybe some of the commentary in Matthew twenty-four. I don't know. Um, I, I would, I would probably disagree with them on First Peter four and five. So even from a trusted source, I'm going to have to read those notes and take them with a grain of salt because I disagree with their conclusions. Um, even though I wouldn't call what they're doing false teaching, um, and, and I'm making that assumption. I, I like I said, I've only, I've only put my hands on an AP Study Bible a couple of times. I just I'm guessing. I'm guessing they're probably not early day guys would be my guess. Um, so anyway, um, let's see what we got here. I think that's we got about seven minutes. I think I pretty well uh, caught up on it. Um, and Jules Johnson's notes, man, I hadn't seen Johnson's notes. And man, I, forever, I remember when I was preaching in Mississippi, my first, um, my first work, we had this brother. I mean, he had his King James Bible. And I guarantee you, right beside his King James Bible, he had his Johnson's notes. And if I um, if I ever disagreed with with Johnson's notes while I was teaching, I was told about it quickly. <laughs> I was told about it quickly. Uh, Johnson's notes, yes sir, yes sir. Um, let's see what we got here. Um, look, I just saw a serious question from Travis. Where did that go? Where did that go? Jonathan, is it a sin to eat blood or raw meat today? Uh, obviously, that's taken from Acts chapter 15, uh, the um, the position that's taken there. Uh, I got six minutes till the top of the hour. My short answer to that, Travis, is no. That's my short answer. Um, because even the, um, look at the, I, I, well, in that list in Acts 15, uh, you've got several things. Obviously, uh, you know, to avoid fornication, obviously that that's always going to be wrong. But I've got statements about that in a whole lot of other passages saying, hey, you shouldn't be engaged in fornication. So um, uh, that, that one's clearly always wrong. But even the other items, not eating, not eating things strangled um, and not eating things that are sacrificed to idols. By the time you get to 1 Corinthians, by the time you get to Romans 14, that is now an optional matter in terms of eating meat that is that is um, um, offered to idols. Uh, by the time you get to um, is it First Timothy or Second Timothy, where they're going to be commanding people to abstain, I, I tell you, I cannot get First and Second Timothy right in my brain. It's it's those it's chapters three and four because that, that idea about doctrines and preach the word, preach the word, Second Timothy. I know Jonathan, you don't have to yell at me, but. Those chapters just mess with my brain. I can't get them straight in my brain at all, ever. I don't know why. But a, a one of the doctrines of, of the apostasy is going to be the the uh, 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 forbidding people to marry and then abstaining from meat. Uh, I don't think it's talking about Catholicism at all. Um, but there were those who were still trying to bind abstinence from meat. Um, and Paul says that's going to be a sign of a false doctrine that's going to come. So by the time you get to that point... They are, you are already dealing with those who have um, turned the, the guidance of Acts 15 around. What I think you have there in the broader kind of setting is that James's point is that we have, you know, in these cities, these Gentile cities, even from ancient times, Moses has been read. So there is precedent for teaching the law of Moses in these places. It should be an understanding of our customs from there. And so he is saying to the Gentiles, do not give offense to your Jew, your Jewish brethren. Now, if you take those things in the aggregate, you take 
fornication, from things strangled, from things with blood, from meat offered with idols, and you put them all together, what you have there really is a summation of pagan worship. So do not engage in the acts of pagan worship because that obviously would hurt the sensitivities of your of your Jewish brethren. And that, as we move forward, we get to the point where we understand the idol is nothing, it becomes a matter of faith, a matter of personal faith, of a scruple, Romans 14. And ultimately, it gets to the point, the idea of you're commanding people to abstain from meat, it's it's a sign of apostasy, a, fine, a sign of false doctrine. So as the, the significance of eating this meat, as, as eating the meat loses its significance to paganism, and as the church largely becomes less Jewish, and so less of a problem, uh, the New Testament softens its position on the eating of meat, even within the pages of the New Testament. So to me, that 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 is a, a pretty clear sign that that was a transitory thing based upon the circumstances of the interaction of the Jew and Gentiles together. That That's my take on the matter. Others would disagree. So, um, but the proper way to eat a steak, so long as it's a good cut of meat, is rare plus. That's the proper way of eating a meat. Okay, I want at least a little heat. I don't want to bite into a cold steak. So give me a little heat, but rare plus. A little heat, but still red in the middle. That's what you want. Beyond that, you're starting to ruin a good cut of meat. Now, if it's a bad cut of meat, yeah, then, then fire that thing up. Let, let's get that thing at least to medium because a bad piece of meat is a bad piece of meat. And I don't want to eat an undercooked bad piece of meat. But if it's a good cut of steak, rare plus. That's all you need. Okay, um, anything else? Um, there you go. All right, we will stop right there. Um, all y'all folks, all y'all folks just don't know how to cook a steak. I tell you, I tell you, I, I, we may have to break fellowship here based on what I'm seeing in the comment section. We may just, we can't go eat steak together. I can tell you that. Please, please don't please don't put your well done steak in front of me on a plate. Just please don't. Please don't. <laughs> uh, anyway. All right. Time for us to head, head to the head to the uh, uh see, see Jonathan. Medium rare is how I used to order it. But I tell you something, when you go to the restaurant, it is tough to get a chef to give you a medium rare steak. It seems like every time I order a medium rare steak. It comes out medium. Back it up a bit. Rare plus. If you get it, actually rare plus. Comes out a little, a little, a little overdone. If it's, it's a little, if it's on the grill for you know thirty seconds too long, you get a nice medium rare. I can, I can live there. So, anyway, um, <laughs> let's let's turn our attention to uh, Second Peter here in just a moment. So let's go ahead and take the break. And uh, I'll be back with you here in just a couple moments, and we will start our study of uh, Second Peter. Thank you for, for all your questions today. Uh, kind of ran the gamut today, all over the place. But we'll be back here in about three or four minutes, and we'll pick up our study of Second Peter together for the second hour of the program.
Well, welcome back to From the Deep End, everybody. Uh, a couple things right before we get into our study of Second Peter here. Um, uh, Morne Stefanis is scheduled to be with us tonight, so keep that in mind. Uh, of course, it's Tuesday, and I didn't mention this in the first hour, but Tuesday is our uh, busiest day here on Digital Bible Study. Um, uh, Fruit Truth Tuesday, scheduled to come on at 10, uh, 11 o'clock, Christianity Now with uh, Tony, Brewer and Aaron, uh, Tony Brewer and Aaron Dotson. Um, all Mays in the afternoon, one o'clock, and then tonight at seven, as I say, morning, Stephanus will be with us, and then at eight o'clock, uh, Tony Brewer comes back with us for the uh, cogitations block that he does uh, for us on uh, Tuesday evenings. So uh, keep all that in your prayers, keep that, uh, that in your mind, and tune in and be with us throughout the day. Uh, I want to give you a quick update on the, uh, I meant to do this in the first hour, and then Travis asked me that question about meat, and then I didn't do it. Um, so I'm blaming Travis. I like to blame Travis for a lot of things. Um, the shorts that we're doing, um, our four-hour standards on YouTube are doing really well. Um, it is interesting like the when they get picked up and when they don't. Uh, you can really tell when YouTube puts one of them in the rotations to get fed to shorts because uh, every, every now and again, about I'd say about 50% of the time, something like that, one will get picked up. And about the other half time, it doesn't get picked up. And when they don't get picked up, you know, they get a couple hundred views, something like that. But when they get picked up and thrown into the shorts feed, uh, like last night, I, I put one out yesterday about how should a Christian vote? Uh, and I'm trying to do some topics that I think are more timely. So I did one on Ukraine. I did one on voting. I've done one on uh, uh, abortion, that kind of stuff. So trying to get stuff that is, you know, has at least a, a, a sprinkling of kind of current event type issues that I think people might just natively be more interested in. Um, and that is okay throughout the day. Um, but about, about midnight last night, it got picked up in the rotation and in an hour had about 1700, 1800 views. So it's up to about 2000 views overall, uh, since, since yesterday morning, which for our YouTube channel is amazing. Getting 2000 views on anything is, is pretty solid. I think our, um, highest ever on a video was about 6,500 or so recently it's about 5,500. So to get 2000 in an hour, um, it's amazing. And it was interesting because you, you can see it on the, on the analytics graphs they give you. It, it was just kind of flat, 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 flat. And then it got picked up by YouTube and it went straight up and then flat, 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 flat. So it was a one hour period of time where it made the rounds. Um, and so, um, um, I say all that, say this, if you see one of our shorts, if it pops up on your news feed, or if you get a notification that it's out there, um, those really have the potential to be viewed a lot. Uh, that's the way those shorts work. Um, and one of the things that all the reading that I've done is that it is engagement, engagement, engagement is always important. When we ask you to like, share and subscribe, man, that is, there's a reason we're saying that. Uh, it, engagement matters big time in terms of um, how YouTube views different different things and so on. Uh, so if you see one of the shorts, uh, because apparently it really matters with the shorts, make sure you hit that thumbs up on it. Make sure you like it. Okay. First of all, if you watch it, watch the whole thing, please. Okay. Because that matters. If you have a one minute video and people drop out after 15 or 20 seconds, that's bad retention. That, that shows that, you know, from a, from a YouTube perspective, if somebody watches 15 seconds and then scrolls to the next one, that says they weren't interested in it. So if you're going to watch it, try to watch the whole thing. It's only a minute long. Try to watch the whole thing so that that time goes up. You could just leave it on your phone and let it play over and over again because you can actually, it actually keeps counting because they want to know if somebody watches it three times. Uh, one of the videos we put up for the first hour or two, it was up in, in terms of percentage watch. It, we had like 106, 107 percent in terms of percentage watch, which means people were they were running it and then letting it run a second time. Uh, so if you're going to watch it, watch the whole thing, okay? And then engage with it. 
hit that thumbs up. That that's a real easy thing to do. Every time you watch one, please hit that hit that thumbs up. Uh, because when you're dealing with the size numbers that we're dealing with, we, you know, we're not somebody out there that YouTube's feeding the video and it's getting five million views. Okay, we're, we're dealing with the difference between hundred views or two thousand views, and you can have a real big impact when you're dealing with that scope because you're not dealing with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. You're dealing with hundreds of people and the 50 of you that are here right now hitting that thumbs up. If you all hit the thumbs up, that's going to tell YouTube, hey, people like this. Uh, even more than that, comment. Leave a comment, even if it's just, again, a thumbs up in the comment section. Uh, if it's just, uh, hey, I've enjoyed the lesson. So you don't have to make a big theological comment, just some kind of comment. Uh, and we are getting some replies on them. We're, we're getting some some good comments. I say good comments. We're getting comments back. Lots of lot, lot, lots of lots of nonsense out there in the comment section. Um, so as they say on the internet, don't feed the trolls. Don't you don't have to engage in all the with all the crazy folk that are responding to the comments. Uh, but commenting is very powerful. Just leave a comment if you would, and that that's helpful. And share. You know, I see I see um, uh, Christine says share them on Facebook. Yeah, share them on Facebook. Twitter, wherever wherever you are on social media, just go ahead and share them because there that that's it's it's great. And the reason reason I'm 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 asking this so strongly right now as we start this second hour is um ninety about ninety seven ninety eight percent of the um viewer t view, time viewed on our shorts is coming from people that are not subscribed. To digital Bible study. That means two things. Number one, they've got a chance to subscribe. That's good. But that, that also means, number two, it is almost certain that the people watching these videos are not members of the Lord's Church. So the things that we end up talking about in those shorts, it might be the first time they've ever heard. Okay, that perspective. So like we did, I did one on um, 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 which one is it? Uh, did, did one on should women be preachers? That that I think that's our most viewed short right now. It's around 22, 2300 views, something like that. Okay. 99% of the people who watched that short were not members of the church. That might be the first time they've ever heard somebody teach that. And those were it, uh, the 2200 views. I think it's about 1900 new viewers. So we had about 300 returning viewers watch it, meaning, meaning that somebody's somebody who watched that has already watched another portion of our videos. So about 1,900 people were exposed to that teaching from the Bible for the very first time, possibly, just through that short. Okay, so it, it, it is the of all the things we've done over the last three years, this is the best tool that I've seen to kind of get us outside of the Church of Christ bubble. Um, and I don't know. I don't know what the long term effect will be. Will it actually lead to people coming in and being a part of our live streams? I don't know. We'll see. But I do know that even if that doesn't happen, at least for one minute, they're getting the Bible taught to them from a perspective they've likely never heard before. And you know, there were two two thousand people watched the one on on um, um, women preachers. Uh, I had another. It was around two thousand or so that also watched the one I think on um, uh, what happens when we die. And both of them had a very heavy preponderance of, of new viewers, meaning the 2,000 people that watched Women Preachers are not the same 2,000 people that watched What Happens When We Die. There's some overlap based upon the numbers, but it's largely a separate crowd. So that's, you know, maybe not 4,000, but it's 3,500, 3,600 people. So... Uh, it's really important. And let me just give you that exhortation here as we get started. Please take a second uh, and, and 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 engage with those shorts. Now, I did something yesterday. I've got one scheduled to release today. It's already filmed. It's just waiting for 10. It's going gonna, it's gonna to release at 1030 this morning. I did something yesterday, and I'm doing it again today. And I don't know if it's going to have any legs or not. I don't know how much I'll do it, but I've done it at least a couple of times now. Um, where I filmed a one-minute short, and then on the same topic, I immediately film a, an eight- or ten-minute video on the same topic, okay, and post them together at the same time. In the description, post the link. So if you go, go to the short, I say, hey, do you want the full answer? Go over here. 
you're watching along, I'll say actually in the one today, I actually linked to it in the video. As I start the video, the, the one that's going to release today, I said something like, hey, if you're interested in getting an answer to this question, but you only have a minute, check out our short. I'm trying to link them back and back forth to each other. So when that happens, when you see two videos that are posted on the same day that essentially have the same title, if you want to try and share that with somebody, you can share the one minute video. If they get back with you and they're interested in it, then you can say, OK, that was the one minute video. Here is a 10 minute, you know, a, a more detailed answer to that Bible question. All right. Uh, I use the same outline. So structurally, they're the same. So if somebody watches the one minute, they can then go watch the 10 minute and, and follow the same outline. Obviously, obviously there's just more detail um, in, in the answer to it. So I don't know. It's a lot of work. OK, <laughs> it's to film, to, to write the script for both of them and to film them both and do the editing of them. It's it takes up a good portion of my time and I do have a day job. Um, so I'm, I can't I don't, I just don't think I can do that every day, uh, but I'll try to do it as often as I can because I like the concept because uh, that to me, to me, if, if we could get somebody to watch the short, get them to watch it, one or two of the, the, the shorter but still longer for, you know, the 10 minute videos. Maybe that might lead them to engaging us in, in a longer conversation on one of the live streams or something like that. So uh, anyway, um, th that's what we have here. Um, so, so sorry to take up that time from our, from our study, but I, I really did want to uh, to mention it. Yeah, uh, Connie, the shorts are on YouTube. Um, shorts do not work the same way on, on Facebook. Um, I mean, they have reels, but I, I like I, I just I I, I like the. Um, the uh, 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 the Facebook way of doing it uh, and and Gita no I'm not putting them on TikTok. Um, first of all, TikTok's just a well. The biggest problem with TikTok is it's a dead end tool. Okay, uh, I get people to subscribe to our to to, a tick, to to us on TikTok. That's all you've got because that's all you can do is shorts, basically, it, 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 and that's it. That's all you've got. Um, Facebook is still it, it, the, the problem with Facebook is that it is it's somewhat insular. It's social circles, friends of friends, and so on. So uh, sh the reels would probably get us outside of that, but I don't I don't like their implementation of it. I, I don't I don't. YouTube to me, to me is the, for us. YouTube is the right place to right place to put it. It is the biggest video streaming site in the world, and I can put them on the same channel, and we can add subscribers that now get notifications every time we do something of a longer format. It's just, it's a, it's a seamless way of doing it and it just works better for us. So uh, I, I'd have no intention at this time to put the shorts on, um, on, um, on either Facebook or, or a TikTok or anything like that. For now, at least I'm going to leave them just on, uh, on YouTube. Um, and Wayne, yeah, uh, I've done some of these too as well, Wayne. Um, I've taken like clips from uh, the Connect meeting at night. Uh, like I, I uh, over the weekend, since I wasn't filming my own stuff, I took a couple of clips from uh, Robbie Jr. I thought he had, obviously his story with dealing with drugs and alcohol was a powerful lesson. Was that Thursday night last week? Uh, so if um, if um, if you haven't seen that, uh, you should. But I took uh, I took two clips from that and put up two shorts from from Robbie Jr. Uh, they did okay. Uh, I think I think right around 600 views, something like that. Um, but um, but then I also put up one for my dad from the Thursday fr from the deep end Thursday where he was talking about the work of Satan, and just I just clipped basically one minute of from the deep end and and put him uh, up there. So I, I will do that from time to time as well. Just and then I tried to link back. Obviously, when I do the short from a lesson, then we link back to the to the full lesson on. Uh, on the video itself. So anyway, um, let's see. Um, uh, let's see what we got. All right, let's turn our attention to the second Peter. We need to get, get into that at least a little bit as we uh, start going today. Today, um, introductory stuff on Second Peter today. We'll, we'll uh, maybe get into the text a little bit. See how how long it takes me here. Um, introduction to Second Peter could, if, if if we were doing a different kind of class, could take days. Uh, for such a short little book, there is a lot of um, um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, challenges in dealing with Second Peter. Um, 
It is, let, let me just, let me, do I have a, I should, yep. Is it in Second Peter? Okay. Uh, this is a Bible knowledge commentary, a, a fairly common commentary these days. Um, it, it's not as scholarly as some, but it's it's better than a lot in terms of the, the level of depth it has. But, I mean, you just start reading through here, and, and there's just stuff after stuff after stuff dealing primarily with uh, the, the authorship of, uh, of, of Second Peter, because it is a book that has been um, very heavily criticized about the, the authorship of, of it. Um, there for several reasons that they, they the, the some, a lot of the scholars believe there are significant stylistic differences, and because of that, it was probably not written by Peter. Uh, Peter's referring to Paul's writings uh, here at the end, uh, where uh, there it is, verse fifteen. And count the patience of the Lord as salvation. Just as our beloved Paul, our bro beloved brother Paul, who also uh, wrote to you uh, according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all of his letters when he speaks of these matters. So Peter references uh, the writings of Paul. Um, and there are some who say, well, wait a minute, how on earth did Peter have access to the writings of Paul if, uh, if, if this, you know, Peter dies? Generally dated around 67, 68. So, you know, in the same basic basic time frame when Paul dies. Um, but in the second half of the of the, uh, the AD 60s, how did he have access to the writings of Paul so that he could, you know, comment on them and how people are treating them? And so that that makes people think, well, it has to have a, uh, a later date. And so it might be early second century when it was written. Uh, there's e there are even those who make an argument based upon the um, uh, the spelling of the word Peter in certain manuscripts, which causes people to think that maybe um, maybe uh, uh, somebody else other than Peter wrote it. Uh, there's a a, a the, the standard Greek way of writing it, and then there would be a way that calls back to uh, the Hebrew form. And I think if I remember correctly. Um, it's the Hebrew form that is used here if from it and so on. Um, so the, there, there are, there, there are those questions. And then of course you have the questions about the relationship between, um, second Peter chapter two, uh, and large portions. Well, essentially most of from about, from about verse four, almost down to the end of the end of the book, uh, second Peter two and the book of Jude. Are not identical, but they're awfully close. They're they're just all, you know pretty close to identical uh, in terms of that. And so people, okay, well, well, wait a minute. Who wrote first? Who used whom? Did they, did they did they draw from a, a common third source that both Peter and Jude referenced then? And then the question, of course, is well, if 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 Jude wrote first, why would Peter, an apostle? use the words of Jude, who is, you know, not of the same standing as Peter. Or if Peter wrote first, then why did Jude just simply replicate that which an apostle had already said? Uh, and if there's a third source, then obviously who, who wrote that th third source and would again apostle have used a third source? All kind of questions like that uh, abound in terms of it. Um, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time other than what I just did in dealing with it. Um, for every New Testament book, essentially, you're going to have those kind of arguments. Um, and on some level, I think scholars just like to write books. I mean, there, there are some legitimate questions there that need to be answered and so on. Um, I doubt, though, in the year 2022, unless there is some kind of new manuscript discovery somewhere, um, that, um, that we're going to find anything that's going to shed a lot of light on it. Uh, and second Peter was, um, was it, where's that commentary? He, he gives some of the dates in, in, in his introduction to the book. Um, where is that? Um, yeah, just the, uh, the, 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 in, in terms of the authorship, um, and, and, and canonicity, the, the author here makes a fairly good point. He says for more than 17 centuries, this brief, but poignant epistle has withstood the blast of secular uh, skeptical scholars who have denied its authenticity and, and, and claimed a Petrine or, or, or Peter's authorship of the book. And then he goes through some of the evidence. Um, 
And the evidence is very early that um, um, it was it was accepted by the early church as part of the canon. It should be used. So we're just going to go down that path. Um, there is there is a thought out there from some that Peter wrote it, but it's not actually Second Peter. All right. Uh, they say that because of the things that are said in the book. First Peter, you date more toward the middle part of the 80s, 60s, um, maybe even early 60s, 62, 64, 65, somewhere in that range as we talked about it. You know, I'm not a huge date guy in terms of getting it that, that specified. You know, there's some people who try to tell you that Peter wrote it on a Tuesday. Um, it was cloudy outside and, and there was a little mist in the air you know, when, when he wrote. Um, but in, in First Peter, uh, it, it's clearly a book of suffering clearly a book of suffering and it's a it's a book of suffering as we talked about at length where the time has come for judgment and everything seems to be urgent it seems to be right there and you're going through it right at this moment um second peter which as as the the introduction here from the ESV says we're going to put that letter between 67 and 68 right before peter's death but you don't have the same kind of language describing the urgency. If, if what he writes in 64 is true about the time has come and all of that, then certainly 67, 68 leading into some of that more intense persecution should also be true. Um, and so there are some people who think second Peter should actually come before first Peter in terms of the writings of Peter. There's a problem with that though. And the biggest problem is um, chapter three he simply says, and this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you. Okay. Um, that kind of makes it seem like it's the second letter. <laughs> now, it does exist. It is possible um, that First Peter is not First Peter. Because what we have, what, what, what we know about uh, biblical writers is that we don't always have everything that they wrote. Uh, you know, first and second Corinthians are not actually first and second Corinthians. I, it's been a while since I've done the, the chronology of that, but Paul in first and second Corinthians references other writings that he's done that we don't have. So, you know, first and second Corinthians might actually be second and third Corinthians or first and third Corinthians or something of that nature, because we don't actually have the other letters. Why not? God didn't see fit to preserve them for us. Um, uh, we, we know we have other letters written by, by apostles in, um, in uh, is it Colossians? Colossians, the end of Colossians. Um, Paul says to the Col church at Colossae, See that this letter is read uh, uh, at Laodicea, and that you read the letter from Laodicea as well. So, Colossae and Laodicea, are just a few miles apart, in the, I think it's the Lycus River Valley. They're at the headwaters, kind of in that area, in that valley up there, um, just up the river from Ephesus, about 100 miles or so. Um, but they're, they're, they're neighbors. Colossae and La Laodicea are pretty close together. So apparently, Paul wrote a letter to the church at Laodicea, and he wrote a letter to the church at Colossae, and he said, hey, I want y'all to switch. When you get done with this one and they get done with theirs, switch them. Okay? So there are other letters that we don't have. They were written, and we don't have them. So it is possible that this second letter that he's writing could be referencing a letter that we don't have. Um, I don't think so. I think it's probably referencing 1 Peter. That 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 that'd be the simplest construction, um, but it does. If, if you go with that construction, let me let me just stop there and say this: that's that's the path we're going. We're going to hold hold fast to the idea of Pauline uh, of, 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 of Petrine rather uh, authorship. We're going to put it right there at that same date toward the end of his life. The fact that it does not seem to be as urgent to me is not so much of a problem because the urgent matters he's already written to them about. He's already told them about the fiery trial. He's already told them about the problems that are coming. And while maybe the urgency is not there in 2 Peter, the content is still there. He's still dealing with the scoffers that are going to come in the last days. He's warning them that not, not to follow down these, the, these false teachers. And so while there may not be the time is here kind of urgency, you know, once you're already in the trial, if the time is here in 64 and, and and we're right on the date 67, 68, I don't need to tell you, I don't need to warn you about the time coming. We're already in it. 
It's already here. Okay. Now I need to help you manage your way through the time. And that's largely what Second Peter does. The bulk of the chapter two is just is just that. Here are these people that you need to avoid. You need to steer clear of these people. And here's how you identify them. Here's their fate. Here's what's happening. And then at the end in chapter, oh, I highlighted the wrong chapter there, didn't I? Uh, but, but that's that's chapter two. Chapter three then actually deals with the uh, the complaint that these scoffers and these these false teachers are bringing in, and that is where is the promise of his coming? So back in First Peter, he's told them the fiery trial is here; it's come upon you, right? And it's happening to your brethren across the world. But then repeatedly in First Peter, I could scroll back up there, but we just got finished with a study of it. I hope you remember the passages. Back in chapter one, you have a statement about the, the the appearing, the coming of the Lord. Obviously, you've got the same thought in chapters four and five that when He appears, this is going to be better. You're going to suffer a little while. You, you, you're the, the you're necessary. You go for a little while through these 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 uh, uh, these, these various trials, and your faith is going to be tested, and so on. So you have that whole construct of here's here suffering it here in the present. It's necessary, <coughs> but it's only going to last for a little while. Chapter 5, after you've suffered a little while, the God, the God of all peace, or the God of peace, rather, himself will restore and so on, establish and settle you. So that's that's in your future. That benefit is coming in your future. At some point, at some point, you're going to start asking, when? When is this going to end? And I believe that's what he's talking about here. I, I we use the term second coming just just we just use the term second coming to describe things um and, and i think that on, on in certain discussions might be a better way of saying it there are certain discussions that we have that i believe we end up hurting ourselves using that terminology because the way that we end up doing it anytime we talk about the coming and we have the term second coming in our brain, you, you know what that implies. That implies there's only one other one because the second one is the final one. That That's the end of the world coming, and that's the second one. So what we have here then when we say that is, all right, if there's a coming of the Lord that's talked about, I have two options. I have his first coming, and I have his second coming. Those are my two options. And so I need to be able to interpret that word coming or appearing or revelation. There's two different words uh, uh, that, that are used to interpret it basically the same way. But his appearing or his coming, his revelation, I have two options. His birth and then the end of the world. Those are the only two options I have on the table. When you think in those terms, you come to a passage like this and um, you have to begin to deal with, well, wait a minute. That, that the only other option is obviously not his first coming because where is the promise of his coming? Well, he already came. He lived, he died, he resurrected, and we saw him ascend back to heaven. So that one's that, that one's taken care of. This is written after that, so this must be the end of the world. That's the way we think. And that leads to um, uh, scholars, not just members of the church, but I mean sc scholars outside the church as well. Sometimes you will see people read or uh, write, write articles. I've seen books have been written about it, obviously that the apostles believed in the imminent return of Jesus. And sometimes that discussion will be had among people, but did the first century church believe in the imminent return to end the world in the first century? Did they think that was going to happen? Okay, to me, that's a misunderstanding of the construct overall because it's based upon the premise that there are just two comings. There's his first coming, and then there's the end of the world coming. And since the, they, since the early saints talked about his coming, they must have been talking about his end of the world coming, and they must have believed because there are clearly statements that anticipate his early coming, that that's what they had to be talking about. Okay, that, that's a misunderstanding of Scripture. There are in Scripture... Um, Dozen, not a dozens, but there, 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 there are several different statements about um, about his um, about his coming. Uh, there are several different times 
that he is said to be uh, to be coming. Uh, let, let me. Sorry, I was trying to pull up something here real quick that I just thought of as I was talking. Um, Give me a second here. Um, let's see if I've got the right thing here. Okay. Um, of comings of the of the Lord. All right. Here, here, here are uh, here is a list of his of the comings of the Lord. Uh, John one fourteen. He came into his own; his own received him not. Is that one fourteen? Um. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've seen his glory and so on and so forth. Um, so he, he came into the world, dwelt among us. He came into his own, his own received him not. Okay, that's obviously obviously his first coming. How about Matthew 10 and verse number uh, uh, 23? Um, persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will have not gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man becomes, before the, before the Son of Man comes rather. You will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. That can't be the second coming. Can't be the second coming. This is the giving of the limited commission where they're to go only to the lost sheep of Israel, not go out into the world, and so on. Um, how can that be the end of the world? Acts chapter 1 says, You shall be my witnesses in, uh, of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Paul says that was accomplished at least in his ministry by the, by the time he wrote Colossians. Um, so, no, I think that's actually coming in his kingdom, Acts 2. You're not going to have time to go through all of Israel until the Son, the Son of Man comes in his kingdom. Um, same idea, though, in, in Matthew, chapter, um, uh, Matthew chapter 16, what verse number uh, uh, 27, I believe it is. Uh, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person to what he, according to what he has done. So the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and he's going to bring judgment when he does. Truly, I say to you, he didn't just change topics. There are some standing here who will not taste of death until they say the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That's not the end of the world. He's coming in his kingdom. And some of you standing here will not taste of death until you see him coming in his kingdom. Well, given the fact that it includes repaying each person according to what he has done, I'm going to say that includes the judgment on Israel. But I believe, again, this to me is not a day. This is a process. Um, he, he comes in his kingdom and then... At the end of that generation, he repays every man according to his deeds. Include it's inclusive then of seventy. Okay, uh, what about Revelation three and verse number three? Remember then what you received and heard and kept it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour will come against you. Okay, he's not talking here about the end of the world. Um, he's talking about his judgment on the church of Sardis. And over and over again, he says in that, if you don't repent, I'm going to come take your candlestick out. That's back chapter chapter uh, chapter two. I'm going to take your candlestick out. So he comes in judgment of the individual churches. Okay, and then you do have passages like First um, Thessalonians chapter four, where obviously um, he does come and. And um, um, uh, with the saints in the air and so on, probably that, that one's what we would typically refer to uh, as the second coming. Uh, and I could add to that Luke 18, 8, Hebrews 10, 37, he that, he that is coming will not tarry, uh, Jude 14, and so on. That, that's just scratching the top of the, the, the surface there. I mean, there, there are numerous examples of the Lord, quote unquote, coming in the Bible. So when you limit yourself to first and second coming, you're really going to struggle in, I believe, in, in interpreting certain biblical concepts, certain biblical passages, because it is a lot more diverse and a lot more complex than that. I personally don't think here, here their complaint is that, that his coming is the end of the world to wrap this whole thing up. 
I don't. There's no reason for them to have thought that. Um, I think he's, they're probably talking here about what what's going on. What is going on is that um, back in chapter or chapters four and five of the um, uh, of the previous epistle is that this judgment is going to come or this this, this uh, to the house of God and it's only supposed to last for a little while. Now I will add this. Let me add this thought though. While I don't think they're talking here about, maybe this may be, may be a more precise way of saying it. There was apparently an interesting doctrine that was afloat in the first century. This is something I've never been able to find anything that I've read that, that satisfied me in terms of an answer or any such thing. But there may have been a misconception in the ancients, particularly the Jews, about what the significance of 70 was. When Peter asks in Matthew chapter 24, well, Peter and the disciples that are there, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age? The Old King James translates that world, okay, what, and, and the end of the world. And, and unfortunately, that, I believe, has confused a lot of people. The word there is not cosmos. It's not the end of the, the world. It's the end of the eon. That's the Greek word there, age, time, time period. But if you're a Jew and you are the people of God to whom God is supposed to restore the kingdom, the power of the kingdom is going to be the, given to the people of the saints of the Most High. That's the prophecy of Daniel seven, which you know I think I may have said this in the past. I, I was talking, I, I was, I'm teaching Daniel right now on Wednesday night. We're in chapter seven, and I made that point as I was teaching the class last Wednesday night. Sometimes we give the apostles grief for what they say in Acts one eight. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Okay, they weren't wrong. The prophecy of Daniel seven was very clearly stating that when the dominion is taken from the little horn. The dominion, uh, the kingdom, and the greatness of the kingdom shall be given to the people of the Most High, the saints of the Most High. Those are Jews. The Jews were expecting the glory and the greatness of the kingdom to be given back to them because Daniel prophesied that it would. Okay, they're not wrong in thinking that. Now Jesus has just told Peter and the disciples that are there, everything you see around you, everything that is Judaism, not one stone is going to be left upon another. What do you think Peter would have thought from that? Do, do, do you think that a group of people who who are a group of people who stood before Jesus and said, "We have Abraham to our father," do, do you think they might have thought that they were kind of at the center of the world? I think they kind of did. Okay, that philosophy, that mentality of we we are the apple of God's eye, we are the center of the world. I, I, this is the part I can't. I, 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 this is where, where I, when I when I started this tangent that, that I'm on for a moment. I don't know that I can. I, I've never been able to, to solidify this in terms of things that I've that I've read. It's just it's just my own trying to try, trying to, to to piece the mental process together in my brain. You know, I don't know that a Jew would have had after hearing that not one stone is going to be left upon another. I, I don't know that a Jew would have had the thought that you know after that day everything's just going to be hunky dory fine. It's all going to be you know uh, uh, lollipops and, and 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 ice cream after that. If if not the end of the world, I mean that this is this is bad. This is really bad. You know, their kingdom shall not be left to another people. Daniel two. Daniel 7, the dominion shall be without end. I think they, I don't think they had the concept that we do, a, a second coming. I think there was something along the lines of this is this is this is it. This is gonna wrap this thing up. And alongside of that, there is a thought that seems to be in 2 Timothy. Um, um 
Hymenaeus and, and Philetus, who are teaching that the resurrection has already occurred. Now, one of two things is true here. Either they're teaching a bodily resurrection or they're teaching a spiritual resurrection. I'm going to struggle to think that um, you're going to convince people that the bodily resurrection has already occurred. That would be pretty easy to see, wouldn't it? But there's something going on there. Same thing in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul tells them, um, let's see how the ESV translates it. I don't remember right off the top of my head here. Um, uh, yeah, ESV translates it kind of in the past tense. Do not be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Um, what? What is your concept that the day of the Lord of the day of the Lord that you could think that it has already come? What, what, what are you thinking? Okay. You tie that back to what's going on here in that leads us into that passage over in First Thessalonians chapter four. That I don't want you to grieve as others who do not hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who are fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, so there's our coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. Why does Paul have to tell them we're not going to precede them in any way? Try to piece that together in your brain. What doctrine is being taught in Thessalonica that what would cause people to think that those who have fallen asleep potentially could miss out on what he's talking about here. Could miss out on blessings at the coming of the Lord. Because that, that I mean, has got to be the consequence of it, right? They're concerned that those who have already passed are going to miss this. And Paul's point is, I don't want you to be concerned about them. I don't want you to, be, to grieve and be ignorant about these about this, brethren, because they're going to be there. For, in fact, the dead in Christ rise first. There's a doctrine that's being taught there. I, and this one I can't prove at all. I can't prove it all. And, but I just, I'm just letting you know thoughts that run through my brain right now. This is all Jonathan 101 for the last several minutes. I read that passage over 1 Corinthians 15, and there are people that are being baptized for the dead in a discussion about the resurrection. That makes me wonder if that is not somehow connected to this. I think all of that goes into the same, into the same pot together. And I don't know how to boil it down to get to the right conclusion about what's going on of it. I think some of it's got to be the, the materialism of of of, of uh, certain segments of Greek philosophy, the materialism relating to uh, you know the, the singular nature of man. We have a dual we have a dual concept of man that man is spirit and flesh. Not all the Greeks had that same philosophy. Um, uh, that there was a, a more materialistic view of it. Um, and maybe that maybe that's a part of it. The person that's dead is just now gone. Um, and maybe they're missing out on 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 things. Um, and because of that, then maybe there's some kind of different thought about the nature of the resurrection, so that you might think that um, the day of the Lord has already come, and the benefit of it is already there, so that you could could over in Second Timothy have begun to teach that the resurrection has already passed. I don't know. There's something interesting going on there. I say all that just to get us back here to kind of set the stage a little bit for Second Peter. Some some portion of that, some thought of that in my brain at least, is tied to this. That as we got farther and farther down the 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 end of this generation, and the prophecies they would have known. 
because Jesus actually, Peter actually makes reference to it in the verses that precede. You remember the, the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior through your apostles. This was foretold. Just as 1 Peter begins, all according to the foreknowledge of God. This is foretold. But what was foretold? Well, the commandment of the Lord about this that came through the apostles. Read Matthew 24. Okay, there's the commandment of the Lord. It was told to you by your apostles. Okay, it's repeated in other passages. 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians, well, 2 Thessalonians 2, I'll go there. 2 Thessalonians 1, maybe. It's repeated. So they've told you about these things. Now, what was the message that was told to them? Well, all of this is going to come to pass in this generation. Jesus is going to come back. You're going to see the sign of the Son of Man. You see the sign of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven before this generation passes. If then you have taken that prophecy and maybe blended it with some of the materialism of Greek philosophy, maybe tied it to, to, to your presumed uh, 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 supremacy of the Jewish people within the plan of God, and you see this, you see this generation coming to an end. Now, you're, you're, you're believing that what's going to happen is that God's going to bring his judgment upon the Jewish nation because that's what he said, not one stone left upon another. And at the same time, um, um, historically, if you put first or second Peter 67, 68, what was happening? Well, Nero dies, was it, is it late 67, early 68? I want to say it's early 68 when Nero dies. Vespasian returns. The Jews rally thinking, hey, we've won. We, 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 we were in rebellion and the Roman armies have left. If, if it's into that vacuum that this book is written and the scoffers know that within the lifetime of this generation, not one stone has to be left upon another. I just there there's enough there's enough there to make me think that an opportunistic individual like these people described back here in chapter two, who are in it for greed, who promise great things, that they're willing to blaspheme about things they know you know that they're ignorant of, and all the things that are said about them back in chapter two, okay, that that individual would not hesitate in any way to take advantage of the confusion and to say the promise of his coming is not right. It's it, it, it's not right. There's another doctrine out there that you ought to be following. You ought to follow us, not him. We'll lead you down the right path. And so Peter then tells them, now, wait a minute. Um, no. God has brought judgment before. He's going to bring it again, and it's going to come. Okay? So I think I think that's kind of in the background of all of this. And it's into that environment into which Peter writes. Now, I, I started this 30-minute kind of tangent trying to set the stage about the urgency of the book of 2 Peter. No, it doesn't have the same kind of the time is now, the time is now, short time statements of 1 Peter. But to me, that doesn't necessarily, doesn't trouble my mind in any way because now we're dealing, now we actually have people we can identify we actually have in the in this in, in, in these places people who actually fit the description of 2 Peter chapter 2 we we you, the people who received this letter as they read through that could put names to those people those scoffers who were saying where is the promise of his coming peter didn't just make that up he didn't pull that out of thin air okay he he picked that statement because that's what was being taught to these places to, that Peter, to, or to whom Peter was right, writing rather, okay, they would be able to read this letter and pick these people up. They would know who they were. Okay, so he's not dealing so much with a kind of a uh, we might say a macro or a meta approach to it that he does really in the first book, where the, these afflictions are happening to your brethren all across the world and so on. What he's now dealing with, I think, is the specifics of your situation. There are false teachers among you who are trying to lead you astray, and here's the specific argument that they're making, and here is my answer to that argument. And understand, they continue to do so. 
They, they just the things that I wrote to you, Paul wrote the same words to you. You heard them from Paul just as you're hearing them from me. So you know I'm right, you know Paul is right, and these other people have twisted their ignorant and then they're unstable, and they've twisted the other scriptures, probably some of the ones we just referenced. They've twisted those scriptures because um you know for their own gain to, to try and overthrow your faith and, and to put you kind of in their party. So I think second Peter is dealing with a much more specific circumstance than maybe first Peter is. That's my thought about the matter. Um, one last thing, uh, this idea that um, um, the criticism about second Peter, this is, this should, in terms of sequence, you need to put this thought way back like 35, 40 minutes ago, because that's where it belongs. But it just popped in my brain as I was going here. One of the criticisms about Second Peter is that how could Peter have been reading the writings of Paul? Um, I mean that 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 to me is is, is foolishness. Um, I, I suspect those those letters got gotten got copied pretty quickly. Uh, just just an example from over there in, in Colossians chapter four. Um, in Colossians chapter four, where is it? Uh, uh, Luke, the beloved, the beloved physician, greets you as does Demas. I give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea. There it is, verse 16. And, in the, and when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church at Laodicea, or the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Um, so put yourself in, in the church at Colossae, and you get the actual original letter of the book of Colossians in your hand. And Paul's instruction is to make sure that that letter is read in the church at Laodicea. Um, what are you going to do? Because it's not long. What are you going to do? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go find me somebody that has a, a, a piece of parchment or, or vellum, whatever you have, and I'm going to make a copy of my of this letter before I send it on to the other church. In fact, unless unless I take that to mean I have to actually send this copy of the letter, probably what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a copy of this letter that you wrote me, Paul, and I'm going to hold on to the original and keep it safe, and I'm going to send them the copy. That's, that's what I'm going to do. And what do you think the church at Laodicea is going to do? They're going to, they're going to make a copy of their letter. They're not going to just give their letter away and not have a copy of it. My guess is those letters were copied really fast and really early uh, and that people had access to them. And Paul started writing his epistles no later than the early 50s. And we're 15 years past that by the time we get to Second Peter. So, yeah, I'd say there was plenty of opportunity for Peter to get access to the uh, to the writings of Paul. So anyway, I need to stop because we should have a 10 o'clock stream coming up here and I need to get off on time. Uh, appreciate y'all's uh, uh, participation today and uh, being a part of the class. And starting tomorrow, Lord willing, we will pick up and start looking at chapter one of the book of 1 Peter. So enjoy it. Again, thank you all, everybody. And tune in throughout the day to all the different streams that we have coming up. And I'll be back with you here tonight, 7 o'clock, for the Connect meeting. Morning, Stefana should be.